Good morning. Let's stand together. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. As we sing praises to him this morning, worthy of worship. Worthy of worship, worthy of praise, worthy of honor and glory, worthy of all the glad songs we can sing, worthy of all of the offerings we bring, you are worthy. Indeed, there is no one like our God, and I pray that as we come here today, that as we acknowledge that and we desire for him to meet us here, knowing the promises we have in Scripture, that he does meet us here, he inhabits the praises of his people, let us truly worship the Lord today. Let's pray together as we prepare our hearts. 
Father, thank you today for the privilege as ours to come into this place, knowing your promises and your word that you meet with us. Lord, we also acknowledge your promises that there's not been a time that you have not been with us throughout this week. Not been a time you haven't been without us or that we have not been with you this morning already. But there's something special about gathering here where we can be still in your presence, that we can humble ourselves, that we lift up praise to your name, and we invite you to do a special work in our life. Lord, this is truly your time, for you are the only one worthy of our worship. And so we bring you a sacrifice of praise through song. We also bring to you, and most importantly, our heart, that we ask for you to work in our life as we come here. So, Lord, would you remove every bit of ourselves from our life? This time is about you. Would you remove all the fear of what you may do? Would you remove any anxiety that's there? Would you remove the struggles that are in our life as we are reminded to call upon you and to cast our anxieties upon you because you care for us? Lord, let this time be edifying to us and honoring to you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Another day is waking up as I stumble to my feet. Down the stairs you're waiting there in the secret place we meet. And I wasn't long on my knees till I heard you whispering. That the greatest gifts in this life are found in the simple things. And I close my eyes and I search for words, words to describe this thankfulness I feel inside. And my heart begins to sing a song of gratitude to you, a song of praise for the simple things. So much to do, so little time we curry through each day we seldom see the treasures God has placed along our way the simple things that make us laugh and sometimes make us cry the little blessings God has placed in each and every life. And I close my eyes and I search for words, words to describe this thankfulness I feel inside. The simple things a childlike faith is such a simple thing 
And that's all you ask A searching heart to bring And I close my eyes And I search for words Words to describe this thankfulness I feel inside and my heart begins to sing a song of gratitude to you a song of praise for the simple things A song of praise for the simple things. A song of praise for the simple things. Calvary. Let's stand together. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died. On Calvary, mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burden so found liberty. On Calvary, by God's word at last my sin. I believe in 
still cling to that old rugged cross. And when time has surrendered and earth is no more, I'll still cling. This morning, if you would take your copy of God's Word and join us in 2 Chronicles chapter 16, as we are going to begin over the next few weeks of looking at some of the kings of old, some of these Old Testament leaders and much that we can learn from them, and knowing as we learn from them that we have a God that does not change and has not changed. And there's, I think, some great principles we can learn in their lives. In a couple of weeks from now, many of our Sunday school classes are going to begin looking at the life of King Asa and what we can learn from him. King Asa is one of those good kings, but yet he didn't finish well. And so I'm looking forward to that Sunday school unit to see how, if they come around to kind of the end of the story. He's one that followed the ways of God, but yet he didn't finish very well. And so as I look at Asa and I consider today, and I consider the fact it's a holiday weekend, and usually who's here on a holiday weekend I think Asa is a warning to those of us that have been in church for a long time. Asa is a warning to Sunday school teachers, to deacons, to pastors, to leaders within the church. For those who, at whatever age, have grown up in church and kind of settled in the routine of church, and we know what usually to expect in our walk with Christ, or what he expects from us at least, what his word teaches us and how we're supposed to respond. We know the standard that's there. But I see so many who do not end, do not finish well. I mean, most pastors do not retire from ministry. They don't finish well. And most church members, if we're honest, do not finish well. I like to consider myself young, but the average male expectancy, I'm, I'm at the halfway point. And to think about, okay, if I've lived half of my life, what will the second half be like? So I want us to consider today how we finish. And let's look at how Asa finished, Second Chronicles chapter 16. We're told in the 36th year of Asa's reign, Basa, the king of Israel, went up against Judah and fortified Ramah to prevent anyone from leaving or entering the territory of Asa, the king of Judah. Asa then took the silver and gold out of the treasuries of the Lord's temple and of his own palace, and sent it to Ben-Hadad, the king of Aaron, Aram, who was ruling in Damascus. Let there be a treaty between me and you, he said, as there was between my father and your father. See, I am sending you silver and gold. Now break your treaty with Basha, the king of Israel, so he will withdraw from me. Ben-Hadad agreed with King Asa and sent the commanders of his forces against the towns of Israel. They conquered Ajon, Dan, Abel, Maim, and the store cities of Naphtali. Then Basha heard this, or when he heard this, he stopped building Ramah and abandoned his work. Then King Asa brought all the men of Judah, and they carried away from, from Ramah the stones and, tim and timber Basa had been using. With them, he built up Gibba and Mizpah. At that time, Hanani, the seer, came to Asa, the king of Judah, and said to him, Because you relied on the king of Aram and not on the Lord your God, the army of the king of Aram has escaped your hand. Were not the Cushites and Libyans, a mighty army with great numbers of chariots and horsemen. Yet when you relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hand. For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. You have done a foolish thing, and from now on you will be at war. Asa was angry with the seer because of this. He was so enraged that he put him in prison. At the same time, Asa brutally oppressed some of the people. The events of Asa's reign from beginning to end are written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. In the 39th year of his reign, Asa was afflicted with a disease in his feet. Though his disease was severe, even in his illness, he did not seek help from the Lord, but only from the physicians. Then in the 41st year of his reign, Asa died and rested with his ancestors. They buried him in the tomb that they had cut out for himself, that he had cut out for himself in the city of David. They laid him on a bier 
covered with spices and various blended perfumes, and they made a huge fire in his honor. There are three transitions, three, we'd say major transitions, across the southeast United States that bring a sense of hope and expectation when they occur. One of those is when a, we have a new president. When a new president is inaugurated, and in the time leading up to then, there's a sense of hope and expectation, usually that things are going to be different. Because usually between the, the first or the previous four or eight years, we've gotten tired of that person. And so we, there's hope and expectation that the newly elected president, things are going to change. The second one is when a new pastor comes. You've been there. You know that hope and expectation, usually you're hoping they're different from the previous guy. And there's a sense of excitement there as you go through the honeymoon stage. But I think the third one is probably the most major and the one that we really build up on. And that's when a new football coach is hired. It doesn't matter if it's high school, college, or the professional level. When a new football coach is hired, there's great hope and expectation that things are about to be different. Because usually you don't hire those guys after a good time. Usually when somebody's hired, it's because you've run off someone else. There's been some issues. And there's all sorts of hope and expectation that things are going to be different. And we talk about those for months to come until the new season comes around and then our hopes and expectations are brought down to reality. Well, here at this time, when King Asa was made king following the death of his father Abijah, I imagine there was great hope and expectation. Because 1 Kings 15 says that Abijah committed the sins of his forefathers and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord. And his reign was marked by war throughout the, the duration of his reign. And then Asa is made king. And chapter 14 tells us of 2 Chronicles that there was 10 years of peace. So you've had a long reign by an evil king who did not follow the ways of the Lord. Therefore, it's why he was evil. And there was war throughout the duration of his reign. Now you've got 10 years. 10 years where there was peace. I imagine that over those 10 years, hope and expectation just didn't continue to increase. And then they were challenged. Chapter 14 of 2 Chronicles tells us about that. Asa and his men are well outnumbered. And we're told in verse 19 that after that time, there was no more war into the 35th year of his reign. So imagine 35 years and you've got one time of conflict. But notice what it says of Asa, if you have your Bible still open. Go back to chapter 15, verse 17. The second part of that sentence tells us that Asa's heart was fully committed to the Lord all of his life. And yet we read chapter 16 where we see that he does not follow the Lord with all of his heart during that time of his life. How do we reconcile those? Well, I think we would say that chapter 15 was written for the perspective of his entire life. Chapter 16 shows us how he was toward the end. And I think if we look at chapter 15 and we see this description of him, and then we look at chapter 16 and we see as we'll get to the end how the people still honored him, the key is that you cannot fool God. We can fool people. We can make people think that they would write stuff about us such as this, that he followed the Lord all the days of his life. He was fully committed to the Lord all the days of his life. And yet, God would tell us about the times in our life when we don't seek him. When we find trust in other things besides him. And we see this change happen in Asa's life. I mean, it was the 36th year of his reign when things began to deteriorate. So for 35 years, challenged one time, God delivers them in a miraculous way in that, at that one instance. They bring back great loot from, uh, of, from victory, have all this stuff, and yet, what happened? He didn't finish well. Again, I think that's a challenge to all of us, something that we need to consider wherever we are in our life, how will we finish? So I thought about that. I couldn't help but to think about those in our church who finish well. We would say it finished well. And I think about who used to sit right behind my shoulder here. I think of Dr. Jimmy Walker, who we just celebrated his life recently and due to the events of his death, we didn't get to celebrate it maybe collectively the way that we would think. But here was a man that was 84 years old and was still an Awana listener and was visiting prospects on Sunday afternoon. I would say that's someone who finished well. I won't ask how many of you are not 84 and don't do anything like that. 
Because see, so often we begin to excuse our age or our abilities or the lack thereof or any other excuses or that it's somebody else's turn and we don't finish well. But people would come and go, oh, look at that person. Look at them. They're such a faithful Christian. They're always at church. They can talk the talk. They can do all that stuff. But we need to remember we cannot fool God. So what happened to Asa? What caused him to have a spiritual decline? What brought this about? Well, there's several things I see in this passage. The first thing I see is that Asa trusted what was convenient. At the beginning of chapter 16, we see that he begins to show us this convenience. But look back first and see how he trusted God. He started with a deep trust in God. Chapter 14, verse 11 Asa and his men are surrounded. They're well outnumbered, not just by men, but by chariots and every other thing they needed for conflict. And verse 11 says that Asa calls out to the Lord, Lord, there is no one like you to help the powerless against the mighty. Help us, Lord our God, for we rely on you. And in your name we have come against this vast army. Lord, you are our God. Do not let the mere mortals prevail against you. Do you see the trust that's there? Lord, there's no one like you. We rely on you. And then they go into battle, and God delivers. And after that, Azariah, the prophet, comes to Asa, and he reminds him of the nearness of God. And how when Asa commits to follow God, God is near and God is blessing. And the words of Azariah prompt Asa to take action regarding the sin in the land. Look at verse chapter 15, starting at verse 8. We see that he, he tells the people to come here. It says he took courage. And then he removed the detestable idols from the whole land of Judah and Benjamin and from the towns he captured in the hills of Ephraim. He repaired the altar of the Lord that was in front of the portico of the Lord's temple. So he comes and he removes the idols that are there. Kings tells us that even there's, there was cult prostitution happening. Basically homosexuality is happening in the temple. He rids it of that. He begins to rebuild the portico, the porch that was there to take care of the house of God so that everything can go as it was supposed to go when they came to worship. Then he assembled all the people, including those who had settled among them. In verse 10, they assembled at Jerusalem in the third year, of the, or the third month of the 15th year of his reign. At that time, they sacrificed to the Lord 700 head of cattle and 7,000 sheep and goats from the plunder they bought back. So they're coming with a sacrifice of their worship, giving to God. They entered into a covenant to seek the Lord, the God of their ancestors, with all their heart. All who would not seek the Lord, the God of Israel, were put to death, whether small or great, man or woman. So saying, you're going to take an oath to follow God all the days of your life. You're not going to, then they killed you. I'd say he's pretty serious about this, wouldn't you think? They took an oath to the Lord with loud acclamation, with shouting, and with trumpets and horns. All of Judah rejoiced about the oath because they had sworn it wholeheartedly. They sought God eagerly, and he was found by them. So the Lord gave them rest on every side. And if that wasn't enough, he looks at his grandmother. Verse 16 tells us, who was the queen. And he removes her from that position because she made a repulsive image for the worship of Asherah. He cut it down, it was a pole. He broke it up and he burned it in the Kidron Valley. Do you see the trust he has of God in this passage? If he's willing to do things that make him uncomfortable, I imagine it's hard to go, Grandma, you're not going to be queen anymore because of the choices that you've made. And Asa is standing there, he's called all the people to, to commit to follow the Lord wholeheartedly. If they didn't commit that, they've ended their lives. But in the 36th year of his reign, things begin to change. They show the king of Israel had somewhat restored Israel's strength and has determined that he would stop the flow of Israelites into Judah where Asa was king. And so he fortifies, fortifies Ramah. It was a city that, that was the most common trade route into Judah. There were guard posts set up, no doubt, along that route to keep people from going to Judah. So this affected the trade caravans. It's affecting their economy. It's affecting the people that are moving there. There's a lot of things happening. But most importantly, it was a demonstration of power for Basha. And if he got away with this, he probably is not going to be stopped. He's going to continue to go forward. Now think about it. We had the king who cried out to the Lord in chapter 14 that there was no one like God. And now, did you notice he goes to the king of Aram, which is modern-day Syria, and ask him to enter into a treaty 
with him. With that question, Asa is putting his trust in another man and in himself. In another man that the king would come, but also thinking, I can get Ben-Hadad to enter into this treaty. I can do what I need to do to get him to come here and take care of me. In a moment of panic, Asa trusted what was convenient, coaxing another man to help defend his nation. Rather than turning in trust to the Lord. Often the convenient looks practical, but the convenient is usually improper or immoral. So often we choose the inconvenient or what is convenient for us. We don't like to be inconvenienced. One man said this convenience decides everything. You think about it, it does. Convenience seems to make our decisions for, for us, it trumps what we like to imagine are our true preferences. That's why we have convenience stores. You can swing in and pick up something and your things go right, you're in and out real quick. But you go in there, say you stop, you need something to drink. You stop at a convenience store, you go and you buy that bottle of 20 ounce Coke or whatever, and you pay for that a whole lot more than if you stopped in a Walmart or a grocery store and weaved your way through all the people to the back, inconvenienced yourself, you usually can get a case for a, just a little bit more than what you paid for that one. But we like the convenience, so we stop at the convenience store. Pick it up, get out quickly, but it costs us more. In our spiritual life, we have to understand there is a cost for convenience. Convenience and discipleship do not go hand in hand, I believe. We cannot say, I'm going to follow God, but I'm going to take the convenient way out. Because convenience, there's a price for that. Asa looks, what am I going to do? I've got Ben-Hadad right out here. He'll take care of me. i got Asa, he's coming toward my direction. He stopped the trade route. He stopped people from coming. He's regaining power. The next step, he's going to come here and take over us. But I can get Ben-Hadad to step in. He'll stop this mess rather than turning to God. We need to beware when we take the convenient way out, the easy way out. For we're leading on a path that we will not finish well. We're leading on a path of spiritual decline. Secondly, Asa took what was devoted to God. He didn't just trust another man and trust himself. He also trusted his money. It appears that Aram and Israel are already partners in an, in an alliance. So Ben-Hadad is already partnered up with Basha. What Asa has to do is get Ben-Hadad to leave Basha, to break his treaty. So what's he going to do? Well, he's got to pay him more than Basha was doing. And so did you see where he got the money? Apparently it was steep enough that he has to siphon it from two treasuries. Verse 2 tells us he took the silver and gold out of the treasuries of the Lord's temple and of his own palace. Now what was in the palace was rightfully his. But what was in the temple belonged to the Lord. And the end of chapter 15, verse 18, tells us there that Asa brought into the temple of God the silver and gold and the articles he and his father had dedicated. So he's brought silver and gold already. Where did he get that money? Well, the end of chapter 14 tells us that when they struck down the Cushites, the men of Judah carried off a large amount of plunder. They destroyed all the villages around Gerar, for the terror of the Lord had fallen on them. They looted all these villages since there was so much plunder there. They also attacked the camps of the herders and carried off droves of sheep, goats, and camels. Then they returned to Jerusalem. So they've already used some of the animals in the sacrifices when they commit to follow God with all their heart. But they gave some of the other stuff in the treasuries of the temple. They gave of the offering. He gave it an act of worship. Thanking God for the deliverance that he had brought to his people. They came and they brought these things. They're in the treasury of the temple. And then Asa went and he took that money, devoted to God, and he sent it to Ben-Hadad. To put it in today's term, Asa took out of the offering plate. He didn't just make change out of it. He took out of what had been given, devoted to God, and used it for something that was unholy. 
I think one of the main reasons the American church today is struggling is because that's our trust. Our trust is in ourself, our trust is in other men, and ultimately our trust is in our money. We look at how what we can work hard to make, and so we begin to trust in our ability to work. We trust in our ability to have a, a retirement account or to have investments, and that's what we find our hope in and our trust in. We're not worried about anything else as long as we got money in the bank, as long as we can retire and be comfortable, as long as we got some good investments, that's all we're concerned about. And we wonder why we don't finish well. Asa's like, well, you know what? I need some money. I've got some here, but I don't have enough. I'll just run down to the temple and take of something that was devoted to God. And what we do is we overextend ourselves financially to the point that we cannot give what is to be devoted to God the tithe and so we hold that back for ourselves, and we are taking that which is to be devoted to God we would never consider probably when the plate comes by you in our time of worship and that's what it is time of worship as we get back to God a part of what he's given to us that that is a trust factor that God I trust you that I can live without this it probably doesn't even cross your mind to think, you know what, I'm going to take something out of that plate today. I'm just grab me whatever's in there, and I'm just going to put it in my pocket. That's essentially what he did. And that's what we do when we refuse to give what rightfully belongs to God. But it's not just money. It's our time. It's our abilities. It's our passions. It's the things we're interested in. What do we do with what we have as a whole? It's your home. It's your family. It's your job. How do we use those things to serve God? How do we devote those things to him? See, oftentimes we look and go, well, God, you know, yeah, that, I could give you that time, but I could do more with it myself. And we take back that time. We hold on to that money. We hold on to our energies. That job is off limits to God. And we end not very well in a spiritual decline. Betty Thompson is a former church member of mine Passed away in the last few months. She was in her mid-80s. So when I was her pastor, she was in her, basically in her 70s during that time. Past retirement age, but Miss Betty always worked. And I, I didn't know why, you know. Didn't know anything about her financial situation. But I knew that she was someone who always was giving. So I had heard the job she had was, a, was funded by a grant. And I'd heard they'd lost that grant. Hadn't had a chance to ask her how, you know, what she was going to do. And she came in the office one day. And she stopped and she said, I'm here, I need to drop this off. And okay, I pointed her the right direction. And when she was there that day to sponsor two kids to go to church camp, nobody had asked her to. She just knew we had kids that went to camp that always needed some assistance. And so she said, I have, I've got a check here for two kids to go to camp. Accepted that, thank you very much, all those, those cordial conversations. I said, I didn't mean to ask you, heard your job's going to be eliminated, you're not going to be working, those sorts of things, and that conversation went on. And never forget, she said, I'll be fine. But the problem is, I won't be able to do this anymore. And she shook that check. She said, because this is why I work. She said, my retirement and Social Security and stuff, that, that takes care of the bills. But I work so that I can do stuff like this. And that's what bothers me the most, is I won't be able to help send kids to camp anymore. It's a humbling conversation, one I don't believe I'll ever forget. That someone who at the time when most of us would want to coast and sit back was working so they could give more, so they could devote more to God. Instead of your life, will you finish well if you your life ended today and what you devote to God? Or are you holding back that which belongs to him? Thirdly, Asa ignored the warning from God. So Asa makes this, this treaty with Ben-Hadad, and he goes to work for Asa, and it causes Basha, the king of Israel, to abandon his plans, and things settle down for Asa. Matter of fact, he's able to go in, extend his territory. He's able to go in and, and take the things they had to build. 
And then we're told there in verse 6 that he built up Gibeah and Mizpah. So we see he's expanded his territory. And Asa probably sitting back, proud of what he did, patting himself on the back. But then that time, Hanani comes, the seer, the prophet. And he tells him the key word in verse 7 is rely. Because you relied on the king of Aram and not on the Lord your God. Hanani is sent to give him a warning, to, to urge him to change. Earlier in his reign, Asa relied on God. That same word we'll find back in chapter 14. And he prevailed over the Cushites. Now he relies on Ben-Hadad and the kingdom of Aram. History should have been his teacher, but Asa shuns divine aid. And as a result, he's told here that the king of Aram has escaped. And so what he's, what he's finding out is that somehow God intended to grant Judah a victory over Aram and Israel. So he's going to give him a victory over the guy that he makes a treaty with and the guy that's bothering him. But Asa blew all of that. Somehow he's totally lost sight of God's sovereignty. Hence the reminder that he gets here that the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Hananiah points out how God is looking to strengthen those fully committed to him. And what he is saying is, Asa, you're not one of them. The eyes of the Lord range out the whole earth looking to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him, and he's not going to strengthen yours. You're not one of them, Asa. Asa doesn't handle it very well. Verse 10 tells us he was angry. And so he was so enraged that he put him in prison. Asa's anger is a sure thing that Hananiah's words are true, and they've hit their mark. In his anger, he imprisons Hananiah, which is the first recorded incident of royal persecution of a prophet of God. But do you also see there that it says he brutally oppressed some of the people? It's believed that he brutally oppressed them because they agreed with Hananiah. That they were people standing there going, yes, you've done wrong. Yes, you trusted what was convenient. You have taken things that were devoted to God you ignored the warning from God, and Asa brutally oppressed them. And every preacher I've ever known who faithfully communicated God's word and shepherded his people can tell stories of being like Hananiah. God has given us his word as a guide, and we often ignore the warnings that come. We read it. And we just pretend that we didn't read it as we're convicted. Or we know what we're going to read when we read it, and so we ignore it altogether. And so God also sends us people to preach the word. And we don't always like what we hear. Matter of fact, if we read God's word with an open heart, do we ever really like it? It's always convicting to me. Never a time that I don't close it and go, wow, God, You spoke to me this way. This is something I need to change. So do we really want to hear the warning from God? Asa has a guy come and put his finger in his face in the picture I get and say, you've blown it. The eyes of the Lord, the Lord's looking at the whole earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. And he's not going to strengthen yours, Asa. And Asa's enraged because he ignores the warning from God. You know, our world today doesn't want to hear from the Lord. And we get so upset about it. We get all up in arms about that. But we shouldn't be surprised when lost people act like lost people. And they have no desire to hear the word of God. I can tell you, I have never had a person, a lost person, confront me over what I've preached. Or confront me when I've confronted them personally about something in their life. Never once have they come back and done what is done here. But I've had Asus show up in deacon's meeting. I've been berated by a church member during an invitation for what I preached. I can see the eye rolls and the looks on faces. I can hear what you see as you look this way and around. I can see defensive posture. We don't like to hear from God. And that's why I am worried. I tell you today, I'm worried about longtime church members because the warning of God is ignored. The word of God is scoffed at. 
Because we don't want to hear it. And so we hear it and we're convicted of sin through the power of the Holy Spirit and through his word. And we get mad at the messenger or mad at what we read or try to ignore it completely. No wonder we don't finish well. And it's happening in our church. It happens in churches around the world. And we wonder why we face the issues that we face. It's that God is trying to wake us up. He's trying to point out the offensive ways in our life. That God is looking going, hey, I'm, my eyes are ranging throughout the whole earth to strengthen the hearts of those who are fully committed to him, fully committed to me. And yet I can't find any. They're lacking today. Why? It's because of the fourth reason. Asa refused to repent. He refuses to acknowledge that there's wrong in his life. See, Hananiah's hope and God's hope was that Asa would immediately repent, and it's impossible, or it's possible that none of this would have came about had he repented. But Asa's heart has become so hardened that he refuses to repent. Instead, he gets angry. Not just at Hananiah, but at those who are saying, yes, he's right. God disciplined this great man, and he rejected it. In the end of the chapter, we're told that four years later, Asa became diseased in his feet. Now, we don't know what this was, but it was significant enough that it draws comment here. We're given no indication, but apparently it was crippling. He suffered continually with unrelenting pain. But the point is made that in his distress, he never once looked to God, but he looked to the physicians. And the implication is that it did him absolutely no good. See, I've learned personally in my life that when we have gone stray from our holy God, he will allow troubling things to come into our lives in order for us to come back to him. And I believe this foot disease was caused by God to give Asa another opportunity to return to the Lord, another opportunity to announce his dependence upon the Lord. When we ignore the warning of God, when we ignore the word of God, and we get upset as Asa did, it's usually because we don't want to repent. We don't want to change. We don't want to let go of some sin in our life, some sort of control, some sort of power that we think we have. And we get to the point where conviction no longer bothers us. And brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. When you get to that point, that is a dangerous place for a child of God. So today I ask you, what sin does God continually call you to leave? But you're holding on to it. What sin that every time you come in here, every time you read God's word, every time you see another Christian, whatever it is, that you're convicted of a particular sin and God is calling you to repent, to turn from that, and yet you continue to hold on to it. My warning today is don't be an Asa. Don't be an Asa who would hold on to that sin and end so poorly in a state of spiritual decline. When I was in high school, I remember an older lady joined our church. She was real energetic and outgoing, real personal. Years down the road, that lady caused a split in our church. And to find out the whole story, she literally had been run off from every other church she'd been a part of before something similar happened. She came, though. She was the first to sign up for stuff. She called and checked on people. She walked around and shook everybody's hand. Everybody loved her. And one particular day, she was proud to announce that she was no longer tempted to sin. And I remember as a high school senior sitting there going, how do you get to that point? But I couldn't wrap my mind around it because I knew this lady had a very loose tongue. She was very prideful. And again, that she caused division in every church she was a part of and then in the one that I grew up in. And as I looked at Asa, I thought about her. That she had become so hardened 
that she was no longer convicted of the sin that marked her life. As far as I know, she's still there today, doing the same things with the same hard heart. So what's the thing that God continually convicts you of? What are those things that are there in your life that God is constantly calling you to repent from? When was the last time you were broken over your sin? That your sin kept you awake at night? That your sin broke your heart? That this is in your life and keeps you from being fully effective in your walk with Christ? It's the last time you were broken of your sinfulness. You're still trying to think back to when it was? It probably needs to be today. Or will you, once again, leave refusing to repent? We see the end of the story. Asa dies and the people mourn for him. The details given in verse 14 show us that they had honor for their king. Even despite their backsliding during the later years, his backsliding during the later years of his reign, the people still love the king. And so they come and they lay him out and they have the spices and the perfumes. They made a huge fire in his honor. All this in this culture was to show we respect this man. We celebrate his life. And I'm sure that as they came and they, they did this and they spoke to his family, they thought of the good things. They spoke of those. They talked about how he delivered them from the Cushites when he reminded them to look to the Lord. And there was somebody who spoke up and said, I was there that day when I wholeheartedly committed to follow God all the days of my life. I'll never forget all those other people that were there. And it all started with Asa. And story after story were told. And the same thing will happen to you. There will be a day that your life will end. And in this church or a funeral home, your body will be laid out. And people will come to honor you. And your family will be here and they'll come up and they'll tell them how good of a person you were and the impact you had upon lives. And there'll be great thing after great thing said about every one of you. But God is not fooled. He wasn't fooled by Asa. He's not fooled by me. He's not fooled by you. And we should be concerned with what he thinks. The eyes of the Lord range throughout the whole earth to strengthen the hearts of those who are fully committed to him. Today, is God strengthening your heart or is God warning your heart? Is God strengthening your heart because you're fully committed to him or is God going, hey, here's another chance. You've heard the word and it's cut. Just like scripture says it does. Sharper than a double-edged sword. And God is warning us today that on the path we're on, we will not finish well. What needs to happen in your life for your heart to move from being warned warned to being strengthened? Would you bow with me? With heads bowed and eyes closed, longtime church member, deacon, Sunday school teacher, church leader, are you finishing well? Or are you in Asa today? Young adult? What are some things you need to change in your life today so that for the rest of it, you believe longer than maybe others that you will be able to say you were, that you finished well? Father God, I thank you for the privilege of proclaiming your word. As hard as it is to be like Hannah and I and to give a warning. God, you know my heart today. And I pray for your Holy Spirit to now empower your people to respond to how you have convicted. God, let us not sit here again another day refusing to repent. 
Let us not choose what's convenient just to stand where we are and wait for the moment to pass. Let us do what and maybe even make us uncomfortable. God, we look to you for the strength that we need. Give it to us, Lord. Let us be faithful. Would you encourage those who need to make public decisions to answer your call at this point to be obedient to them? And Lord, maybe there's some here today whose hearts are not fully committed to you for they've never confessed their sin to you and acknowledged their need for a Savior. And today they need to experience your salvation in a powerful way. Work in our lives, Father, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand together? As we sing, this altar's open. We'll be here to receive you as you come. Let us not choose what's convenient. Let us choose what honors God. All to Jesus I surrender, all to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily. you to ponder how many times have we sang that song and then we God I surrender all but what is God calling you to let go of that you haven't let go of yet what are you refusing to repent from what are you refusing to devote to God we truly sing that song God I've given all Will you pray with me? Father, we do thank you for another day and the blessings you've given us. Father, I pray that you would help us to finish well, Lord, that we would give everything to you and, and not hold back. And Lord, call on you in our time of need and not depend on ourselves or others. Thank you now for the blessings you've given us and we can return part of that to you today ask you to bless it in Jesus name amen <laughs>
As always, it's an honor to worship with you today. Thank you for that choice, uh, you, the choice you made to be here. And I look forward to seeing what God continues to do in our lives and within our church this week. I uh, note uh, that we will be back for service on Wednesday, and there's other things in your bulletin for you to be aware of. I encourage you to, to note those and to be uh, involved as you have the opportunity to do so. This past week, our youth went to youth camp. And uh, Aaron, if you want to tell us a little bit about what happened, if you guys want to come on up here. And uh, as he talks, and Mason, if he goes too long, just reach over there and a little punch or so. Okay. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, we just got out of youth camp Friday uh, morning or Friday afternoon. And uh, one thing that was said to me at youth camp that I just want to share with y'all, it's so important to me. Um, there, are, there were hundreds or thousands of decisions made at youth camp this week. And our youth group, uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of decisions. Uh, some of those decisions were to tell their best friend about the gospel or to begin to actually memorize scripture or read God's word or devote more of their life to Christ or rededications to Christ. But we had some decisions that we just want to make public to you as a church. And so, um, first of all, I want to uh, introduce y'all. Y'all know Mason Myers and Nick Bradford. And so, um, Mason, for over a year now, has been sensing a call into ministry. And, and Nick, for several months now, sensing a call into ministry. And so, while at camp, they both um, made public and want to let you know that they, uh, while they may not know the specifics of what that may be, they sense God's specific call on their life to pursue Him and to pursue ministry in some way. And so, we can be praying for them as they continue to explore that and see what that is. And then also uh, we have Ashley Newton and Alicia McCree. And um, both of them uh, decided and chosen to uh, give their life to Christ while at camp and, uh, and make him Lord over their life. And so we can celebrate with them as well. And, and certainly we'll be, uh, you know, following in baptism moving forward. And so. All right. And your affirmation there is a reminder to them of uh, the support they have with the body of Christ and the importance of the church. And uh, also that as we go forward, you have people that are going to uh, support you, but also hold you accountable as well and celebrate with you what God uh, is doing and will do in your life. And they're going to want to let you know of that uh, as we wrap up here in a second. So after we sing, you guys stand here and you all come up here and let them know uh, how proud of them you are and to make a commitment now to begin praying for them. So let's stand together as they're standing here as a demonstration that we do stand with them. And as we sing, you guys can go back and stand here at that time. And let's declare how great our God is as we wrap up this morning. How great. God bless you. 